Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. I'd like to make a special introduction for this particular interview, which is Dr. Thomas Seyfried at Boston College. I've had a number of prequels to this particular interview to help sort of parse out some of the information. He is such a passionate presenter. The information he presents at any presentation you may see him at is very information intense and thick, sentence by sentence. So that's how he lives his life, is intense. And he's done a lot of work to get where he is. Instead of going over credential after credential, and some of that you already know because you've listened to his past podcasts and he's certainly searchable on the internet, I would like to give you a visual analogy of what I believe uh, he is in today's world of research for cancer in particular, he has certainly broken from the past and he has really worked on elaborating cancer as a metabolic disease. And you know that we've talked about that. So let me give you this image. Let's go back in time about 200 years plus back to maybe a small town in New England in the fall. I grew up in New Hampshire, so it's easy for me to picture. Let's pretend it's at the peak of foliage and you go into your small town and at this time of year, they have a, what they call a woodsman's weekend. That's a lot of athletic events in that context from PV turning logs to ox pulling uh, contests to cutting trees, who can cut the saw and so on and so forth. But one contest in particular is very skill oriented. And that is a person, man or woman, usually men, would stand 10 to 20 to 25 yards away from a rail that's placed vertically on a stand and support it. And this individual would take his hatchet and throw it with the idea of one hitting the rail, just like a archery contest. Whoever gets closer to the bullseye wins. Well, this particular contest, if you are so good at what you do, throwing, the force, the trajectory, you know, calculating how far it has to go, if you are precisely perfect with what you need to do, that hatchet will strike the rail at a precise point and shatter that rail from top to bottom. And so, if you can imagine, in this particular village, somebody showing up after long lines of people taking their whack at it, and to see this happen, which seldom happens, nearly never happens. People will hit it, certainly, but never shatter the rail. But Dr. Tom Siegfried is that person in the context of cancer research today. He has shattered what current cancer therapy has assumed to be true, that it was a genetic-oriented disease, what they call the somatic mutation theory. He's taken his hatchet from 25 yards away and precisely landed it with documented research after research after research. And finally, his word and his work is spreading around the world and being implemented slowly. It is absolutely the edge of a paradigm shift. No further ado, I hope you enjoy part one of this interview with Dr. Thomas Sigrid. Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, the ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive in one way it's simple and one way it's a little bit complicated. Oh, here we go. Hey, Tom, hey. how are you? Carl, nice to see you today. Can you see me okay? Yeah, I can see your head over your desk. There you go. A lot better. Tom, thanks a lot. Boy, I have to say, I just listened to uh, the interview you did with uh, Peter Atia. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, I think that came off pretty well. I mean, it's a small seminar in itself. Yeah. Well, he was here in my office, and uh, he, spent, he spent quite a while. And I said to him he could ask me whatever he wants to ask. 
And he was, as you heard, I think he asked me quite a bit of questions. And then his colleague, um, Bob Kaplan, was here in the office to uh, collect the references and in, in support of what of what I was saying. Right. You know, I, in part, I feel like I'm asking you to repeat so much of your information, but it's so fascinating. And every time I thought I had a handle on what you were talking about, I realized it was a deeper level. And um, I'm going to jump ahead, but we'll go back to the beginning is like the whole uh, substrate level phosphor phosphorylation is was something that I was unaware of. I thought I knew Warburg and everything else, but let's get into that later because that's a big key to okay. of all this. But some of the personal questions I have is like, you were a Vietnam vet. That's right. And then how did you go from there to, gosh, I think I'm interested in biochemistry. Yeah. Well, I had done biology before I went into the army and, you know, I was very interested in genetics, but at that time in 1968, everybody had uh, was being drafted. Yeah. So it wasn't um, the plan. No one could really make plans uh, to do anything. Right. You know, so I just decided to join the officer corps in the field artillery at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And then I spent about a year in Germany and then a year in Vietnam with the first cavalry division. So I spent almost my whole time in the jungle um, and maybe 60, 60 percent of the time in the jungle and and 40 percent of the time on the on the fire base. So it was kind of split between jungle and fire base. You know, either neither neither one was at what we would call a comfortable existence. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was your perspective like, I don't know if life's going to last another 10 minutes, but I might as well apply to, uh, you know, graduate work and see yes. what I'm. Yeah. So I had already thought about applying before I had gone into the military. And 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 then, as I said in Travis's book, I, I actually applied to dra uh, graduate school while while in the jungle in the and and the paper was full of mud and stuff. And I, I just <laughs> never thought anybody would accept a, an application like that. But but they did. I went to Illinois State University, got a degree in genetics, master's degree. And then I went to the University of Illinois and got a, I got a PhD in genetics and biochemistry. At Urbana, That's, right? At Urbana, yep. yeah. Champaign-Urbana. And then, and then uh, I did a lot of work on lipid biochemistry and uh, mammalian mouse genetics. And I just followed that uh, with a postdoc at Yale. And then I got on the faculty in the neurology department at Yale. It was a clinical department of neurology. Right. Right. So, um, you know, it was mostly epilepsy work. I wasn't doing any at the fir at first I wasn't doing any cancer research there at all. Uh, but then we started to look at gangliosides and tumors. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I started to get interested in, in tumors in the mouse. And then we started to, um, you know, it was always a back uh, a, 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 a side project. I had a couple of NIH grants over the years to support the work, but most of the work I was doing was in epilepsy. Right. Um, but the cancer stuff um, was on angiogenesis, which is blood vessels in the cancer cells, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, people thought that was hot, you know, gangliosides control angiogenesis and, you know, it was academic stuff. I, I couldn't I couldn't see off the bat how any of it would be applied to any person in the clinic. And I, I would say 90 percent of all cancer research is done with no no interest, not an interest with no connection to what goes on in the clinic. You say that um, because somebody just needs to come up with another idea, get it funded, and move on, but not have a yeah. Your your job in cancer research is to is to sustain your research program. <laughs> it, it, it's nothing to do with keeping people alive in a cancer clinic. Uh, <laughs> I mean that's that's a fact. Yeah. Um, so uh, I mean they 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 go under the umbrella. It's cancer research because you're studying some some growing some tumor cells in culture on the ass of a mouse. But but you know it's it's just um, it, it's not like oh this therapy is definitely going to is going to have an impact. And, but, you know, it's funny because everybody's paper, everybody, I would say, you know, 80% of the papers that are written in cancer research, this finding could have some significance in the clinic. Right. And that's the end of it. It is. Uh, this, this could have some value in the clinic. This might do this, this might do that, but nobody's doing anything. Right, right. So we have 1600 people a day dying for things that might help them. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, now I understand why they say that. Let me go back because um, that a couple of things. It's really interesting. You were uh, working on epilepsy, which you would have oh, thought yeah. would have been automatic to the ketogenic diet, but you took kind of a different route and you came back to impart the ketogenic diet as part of being the metabolic therapy. Would that be yeah, correct? Well, yeah. yeah. Well, we started with calorie restriction. And um, because it's well known, documented in the literature, that just cutting calories can significantly 
reduce tumors. And we found that this, we and others yep. had shown that this is linked to angiogenesis. So if you want to stop angiogenesis, reduce calories. And then we found, and others found that, you know, um, one of the mechanisms for calorie restriction is reduced inflammation. So everybody knows that cancer cells and tissues are inflamed right. with the growing tumor. Wow. So calorie restriction reduces inflammation, but we had to show that it works through the NF kappa B signaling system. So mm -hmm. each of these observations had to be linked to a series of signaling cascades, you know, uh, AKT signaling for VEGF and, you know, people, mm -hmm. the, the guys in the cancer field love mTOR, AKT, right. they like all that right. stuff, you know? Right. So you got to do something that, oh, you know, that's like, oh, you got mTOR. Wow. This is the most important thing. So, um, you know, you do this stuff only you need to get money. Right. If, if you say, you know, you're not going to study AKT signaling, it's very hard to get any money or VEGF or, you know, what's, yeah, the, what's yeah. the molecular mechanism? Right. We spend so much time in the field looking for mechanisms, molecular mechanisms for things that may have no relevance to the clinic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's two fields of cancer research. <laughs> One is just pure basic stuff. And the other is 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 clinically applicable. So. Um, you know, you think that the basic research should set the platform for why something should be tried in the clinic. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the purpose should be the purpose of cancer research is to say this work that I'm doing will have a direct application to what's going on in the clinic. Right. And, um, and, and, and I think that's, that's important. So, you know, we, we were doing all this on mice with, and we also developed some of the best animal models for the disease in my laboratory mm -hmm. um, over the years. You know, I, I, I worked indirectly uh, with um, Harry Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry Zimmerman was the physician who started the first uh, department of neuropathology in the United States at Yale University back in, I think it was the 19, late 20, early 30s. And he was still alive when I got into the field. Was he one of your mentors or he just happened to be there? He, he, he was, he was at, um, at Mount Sinai in New okay. York city. Uh, but I, I had a lot of phone conversations and letters uh, that I had communicated because he was the guy who started the, doing the first brain tumor work. One of the first by putting chemicals into the mouse's brain and developing brain tumors mm -hmm. and then classifying uh, all these tumors and uh, showing how similar they were uh, histologically to human tumors. But in my book, I think in chapter three, I exposed the fallacy of the, the ambiguity of how anybody looks at brain tumors. It's a, it's a real mess. Mm -hmm. um, no, everybody has a different opinion and no, it's what it is, is group consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, if you allow neuropathologists to make a decision on their own, it's often very different from their colleague that would make an independent decision on his own. So they all come together as a group and they come. So it's a consensus thing. Mm -hmm. So when you go around the field, all this consensus, and then you give these people individual tumors by themselves uh, uh, to ask, and everybody has a different opinion about what it is. Mm -hmm. So it became clear to me that these guys don't, don't know anything about what they're doing. <laughs> Who cares? Classification of the tumor. <laughs> and does it, does it make any difference what you're going to do to the patient after you classify the tumor? Right. No, you're still going to cut and radiate the guy. So uh, what difference does it make? What kind of 12 it's this. And then if you go in and cut the tumors out too prematurely, you cause a, a low grade to become a high grade. And they don't like to talk about that, mm -hmm. but you know, a good 25 to 30% of all glioblastomas started as sec as low grade tumors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a terrible, it's actually a terrible situation. I'm trying to, I'm going to write a paper on um, trying to change the standard of care because what we're doing to these brain cancer patients is, is, I agree. Terrible. I agree. Absolutely. So, Before I get the, the horse in front of the cart, I wanted to go back, back when you were studying lipids and you were, um, how did you, you crossed or you came across the comp a company that asked you to do some research. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you did, and you realized it was kind of, it wasn't the, uh, the drug at all. So, no. uh, but that's a great calorie restriction. That's right. So, yeah. So we, then we wrote a, a, a chapter in a book um, on indirect calorie restriction. A couple of people had, had mentioned this actually uh, Albert Tannenbaum a long time ago had mentioned this about drugs that if you give a drug to a mouse and it makes them sick, mice, mice don't vomit, you know, um, they just stop eating. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens is if the mouse stops eating, Oh, the tumors start to shrink. So if you take the drug out and just restrict the food intake to the same level as the drug, the tumor shrinks to the same level mm -hmm. many times, not all the time. And that's but, exactly uh, what you did in that, in that yeah. particular, right? 
Yeah. So it told it, and besides the drug targeted ganglion sides, it wasn't like the drug wasn't. So it was at the first, it looked very interesting. The drug that we used blocked ganglion side biosynthesis, but also shrunk the tumor. So it was at the so the company that made the drug was very excited because they thought that it was the shrink that was the reduction of the ganglion sides that was responsible for the shrinkage of the tumor. But we then later on uh, found out that the drug, uh, the, the restriction of the ganglion sides had nothing to do with the shrinkage of the tumor. It, it, it was the food intake. So we did some control experiments and, and um, I can't remember the details. I'd have to go back and look, but, but it wasn't the ganglioides. So uh, we, ex- and that got the drug company upset because they thought they had a um, thing there. It turned out to be again, indirect calorie restriction. They want their and money we back. Went, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's actually what happened to, um, Oh, what's the, the woman's name? Yeah. She's kind of famous. Um, she worked with uh, a drug company and they spilled the, the beans in advance she pulled uh, her stocks out of the drug company, <laughs> but I look back at that uh, that drug. Um, Martha was it Martha Stewart? Yeah, it might have that been. Was, Martha, was Martha. Yeah, it was. She's been a year in jail, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. So I went back and looked at that uh, that drug that got her into all this trouble, or that company, I guess. And it, I, in my mind, it was working through calorie restriction. Wow. So uh, when I get when they give the drug to the mice, they, they the tumor shrunk, but their body weights also shrunk comparatively. Mm-hmm. So it was clearly, in my mind, it, the, the major effect of whatever that drug was, um, independent of stock investments, right. uh, um, it was working through calorie restriction. But it had bigger implications only because of all the other riffraff that went yeah. around associated yeah. with it. Yeah. But I went back and looked at the drug and I said, damn, that drug is only, that's the same thing I was looking at, you know, something that was calorie restriction. Mm-hmm. So then you say to yourself, you know, how many of these drugs uh, are in fact working in part uh, through indirect calorie restriction? Mm-hmm. And how many people who receive these drugs, who stop eating and get vomit and all this other stuff, uh, is working through indirect calorie restriction? So it's very hard to design an experiment to, to control for fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, but you have to do that in order to, in order yeah. to identify what, what the therapeutic benefit is. And generally it's a combination of both. The drug is targeting and killing some of the tumor cells, but also at the same time, causing the host to restrict intake of calories for a variety of reasons. Mm-hmm. And together you get some sort of a therapeutic benefit. So, um, and that's the whole field has never been uh, evaluated clearly uh, like that. Right. Uh, Albert Tannenbaum, in my mind, and some of the other early investigators, they were the guys that did a lot of these kinds of studies. And it was very clear back in the 1940s and 50s, you know, that you really have to be careful right. uh, when you do these kinds of studies. So, Tom, when you got into, you know, the, the calorie restricted ketogenic diet, there's calorie restricted. You know, take out the protein, take out the fat. So how did you, was it still epilepsy in the back of your mind, realizing, you know, ketosis is part of this? When did you switch to, I mean, it's now, you know, one of the cornerstones of the overall metabolic therapy uh, that you're working on, but it didn't necessarily, you can go from calorie restriction to calorie restriction ketogenic diet. How did that? Well, yeah, well, we felt that to tell human beings that the best way, a good way to manage your cancer is stop eating for a month. Well, they're going to look, they're going to look at you like you're, you're some nut, right? right? So, but that works. Actually, I've got, I've got papers. I've got people calling me from different countries who actually done that to people. 30 days of just water only. It's unbelievable. I would the love response. to read those. That is such a yeah. great topic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, it works and humans just have to do it a longer time, you know, right. 14, right. 21 days. Um, these kinds And people say, oh, I'll be dead. I'll be dead. No, you won't. I talked to George Cahill at this before he died. He was the, the head of the Joslin Diabetes Center Absolutely. here in Boston. Yeah. And George and I would go for hours talking about all these kinds of things. And he would tell me stuff that, you know, you can never do today in today's medicine that he did to people back in the 40s and 50s. But, um, and 60s. <laughs> yeah, in <and laughs> 60s. So um, he, he, he did a lot of that stuff. But, but um, no, human. So it's not practical. And when we found out in the mouse that when we restrict 40% calories, because they have a basal metabolic rate that's six to seven times higher than ours. Um, 40% calorie restriction to them is like a water only therapeutic fast to us. So, um, and then we did all the biochemical parameter measurements and their blood sugars and ketones shifted in the same param- ways that a, a person water only fasting would do. Okay. As a matter of fact, when humans do water only fasting, you can bring your blood sugars down lower than the mouse and high- ketones much higher than a mouse can get. Wow. So humans are, are supremely designed to, to go long periods without eating. To starve. Yep. Yeah, yeah. A mouse, a mouse will die in five to six days without any, just water with no food. Right. 
you know, humans are just getting started at five and six days. You know, the body is yeah. just starting to ramp up. Right. So, um, so we, we realized that you couldn't be seriously recognized if you're going to tell people to, to, to stop eating for, for 30 days or something. So uh, having worked in the field of epilepsy as long as I did, knowing how we stopped epileptic seizures with ketogenic diets, and we, we published some really beautiful papers in the field of epilepsy, where we were able to identify glucose as the, as the provocative variable. Hmm. And to this day, no one's really sure how the ketones are actually blocking the seizures, what hmm. role they play. But clearly, if the glucose is high, you can't stop seizures. And then, and then I, I had long talks with um, the late John Freeman. Uh, John was the, the person who held on to the ketogenic diet. At Johns lab, Hopkins. Absolutely. At Johns Hopkins, yeah. He He's was a, a friend of mine. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, John and I would have very long conversations at the epilepsy meetings. Uh, discussing all of the variables, and he told me one time that um, in his in his uh, um, uh, practice, he f would find every now and then you'd get a kid that uh, liked the ketogenic diet, and they would eat a lot of it. And um, he said those kids never we could never manage seizures in those kids, the kids that would eat a lot of ketogenic diet, because most kids don't like it, and they eat only only as much as they have to, and um, and and it was actually and human beings are a little different than mice. We, we, we have an anti-appetite uh, effect from fat. Hmm. It, 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 it triggers the hormone cholecystokinin, which impacts on the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, to shut down appetite. Yeah. The mice don't have that. Uh, they do have it, but its effect is not, is not as robust as you see in humans. Got it. So kids don't usually like to eat ketogenic diets. Hmm. So, they're, so we have to make sure they get enough so that their, their body weights continue on a trajectory that would be appropriate uh, age age appropriate trajectory. Right. Otherwise, you know, we, we're going to cause them to have de developmental delay. Right. But if kids eat, you know, a buttload of ketogenic diet, like what? Who, this kid was pouring f oil on ice cream, and he—I mean, he was like keto ice cream with oil on top. He put—he loved oil. I mean, it was like oil everywhere, and um, he couldn't. We couldn't stop. John told me we got a couple of these kids every now and then, and they just get into this diet, and they—and we can't control their seizures, so we have to make sure it's always restricted. So most humans will restrict it, but some, so in the mouse, we must restrict. Got it. Now, some mice, it's all dietary dependent because I have some strains of mice that if you transition them from a standard carb diet, chow, mouse chow diet to a keto, mm -hmm. they would starve to death. They would not eat the ketogenic. Wow. So what we did is we put them on a water only fast for 18 hours, which is like one week in a human, um, almost, you know, five or six days so that they're really, really hungry. And then we'd give them the diet and they would eat it. Uh, and they would eat it, uh, but we would still have to restrict it so that we would have a comparable reduction in body weight. We did a lot of these kinds of physiological studies and found out that it's the body weight that's the most critical variable. So when you compare animals under different dietary conditions, you must make sure that their body weights are exactly the same. That sounds incredible so, to do, really hard to do. So you had the controls, you had to measure every day and saying, well, we yes, got to match yeah, them to the... Yeah, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> wow. Absolutely. So it's a lot. It's a labor intensive. That's why our research is not cheap. Yeah. Uh, we have to pay a lot of people to work on these. It's like having a clinic with all your patients being mice. <laughs> so, um, you know, you work, each mouse is in his own cage. Yeah. Um, we b measure his body weight every other day. We measure how much food he ate. Uh, how much water he drinks, you know, his body weight, and then we treat him. And we got to make sure that, you know, his body weight stays uh, the same. So we don't run into inadvertent calorie restriction. Hmm. And then if you're doing brain cancer research, which is very fascinating, um, they get a, a, a massive uh, binge eating appetite. The, when you injure the brain, uh, you cause a, a massive increase in, in, in basal metabolic rate. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So the mice will eat sometimes 30 to 30 to 40 percent more food than they would normally eat, but for the fact that you now put a tumor in their brain. And we did we did sham controls where we would just put the troker into the brain to damage the neural tissue and then, you know, uh, sew them up. And then and you watch about three days after the surgery, they would start eating like crazy. It was wow. unbelievable. Wow. So apparently they needed the energy to correct the neural the, the neural tissue. Hmm. So um so we had to we had to balance all of these different factors together when we were doing these kinds of things. So you have to keep otherwise you cannot interpret the data. 
-hmm. It becomes extremely difficult for data interpretation. If you're looking at molecular mechanisms of angiogenesis and inflammation, and you're not controlling the physiological variables, then you'll be, then you'll be misinterpreting the data that you collect. Right. Right. So right. it took us, you know, it took us 15 years of, of, of trial and error kind of experiments to do and learn about the physiology of the mouse in relationship to the physiology of the human to right. do these comparative. So that when we were going later on, go into the clinic, we would be able to make uh, uh, recommendations uh, as best we could that might, might be more appropriate for the human species than for the mouse itself. Okay. So we did a lot of basic, 15 years and 20 years I, of basic research. I have no doubt. I, I mean, just any of your studies sort of leave me in all. But here's, let me just sort of put it in my words. Are, were you on the path of, of realizing that calorie restriction was the key, not so much the ketogenic diet, it was the glu dropping the glucose and the fact that there was ketones that feed normal cells. Well, that's a good thing, but it's really the lack of the glucose that is the, or the lowering of the glucose is the bigger deal here. Is that yeah? Well, it's a, well, it's a combination of both. When we okay. worked with ep when we worked with epilepsy, as I said, you couldn't manage the seizures unless the blood sugar was down. Got it. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, what did the ketones do? Well, ketones are known to be neuroprotective. We right. know uh, a, a vast amount of information from Hans Krebs from the Krebs cycle and his and his last graduate student Richard Veach uh, from the NIH. Right. I mean, these guys had had looked at the role of ketones and. And, and, and Veach showed that they reduce uh, reactive oxygen species. They increase the delta G prime of ATP hydrolysis. So they do a lot of good things. But the cancer cells from the Warburg theory, uh, they need fuel. They need fermentable fuels. So the ketogenic diet is simply taking away or reducing right. a key fuel, while the ketone elevation is simply allowing normal cells to function in the absence of glucose right. and protecting the normal cells. So the, it, it, not that the ketones are... We're not sure if they're responsible for killing tumor cells by elevating ketones. Mm. We're just using the elevated ketones to allow, to allow us to marginalize the tumor cells, which are dependent on the glucose. Mm -hmm. right. So it's an elegant internal system that allows the body to, the normal cells of the body to function uh, appropriately, while the tumor cells are struggling right. uh, to survive. So the ketone elevation is designed primarily for two reasons. Number one, to protect normal cells. And number two, to allow us to push blood sugars down to levels that people would say would be life-threatening. But we know from the work of humans, Denkler or somebody, where they fasted for tw uh, 30 days, I think it was 20 or 30 days, 20 days, water-only humans, and then gave them large dose of insulin. <laughs> All right. You're normally if you took that same dose of insulin and gave it to anybody, you'd kill them. Right. So they got the blood sugars down on some of those people to 0 0.5 millimolar or nine milligram per deciliter. Now, as a physician, oh, this guy should be dead. Now, he wasn't dead. There wasn't any hypoglycemic associated with him. But his millimolar ketone was four to six, four to six millimolars in the blood. So they completely protected his brain from a level of sugar that was almost un unmeasurable. So that told us clearly that if we want to kill cancer cells that are dependent on glucose, we just have to transition them to therapeutic ketosis right. and then hammer those glucose levels down. And the other beautiful, uh, which we showed in our mouse models, is in order to get you know, glucose into cells, you have to have receptors. Mm -hmm. You know, There's the gluc transporters, right. and there's, there's a slug of these gluc glucose transporters. Gluc 1 is the major one. Right. Well, cancer cells are garnished with these glucose transporters, so they're taking in as much glucose as they can get. But when you take glucose out of the microenvironment, the, the normal cells uh, of the brain and other areas upregulate those transporters because so, they want the glucose too. Right, so they have a competitor. Yeah, now you're using your normal cells as a direct competitor against the tumor cells. So this puts even more pressure on the tumor cells. Nice. So if you can, that's our, so therapeutic ketosis, which essentially involves low blood sugar and elevated ketones, uh, puts tremendous pressure on tumor cells, on tumor cells that require glucose for survival. Right. right. So that's why the ketogenic diet done appropriately is such a powerful therapy uh, for, tra for targeting all kinds of cancers. One of the interfering problems is the standard of care. It seems like we, we always have to uh, treat somebody with some toxic chemical mm -hmm. because they, don't, they can't understand that you might get the same level of therapy if you didn't use the toxic chemical. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> They're a little vested in that. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm saying, you know, I think in some cases, mm. these toxic chemicals interfere with the, with the elegance and the beauty of the ketogenic diet, just so that we can, you know, say that we treated this patient with, with something. Right. But, right. you know, why don't they treat him with the metabolic therapy rather than the toxic chemicals? I'm with you on that for sure. So I want to back to the question now. So now I have the ketones and the glucose and uh, we can even go back to Warburg. Do you have, and I know you have the, uh, the glucose ketone index and, and yeah. better than one, but, uh, and that's a one to one uh, millimole to millimole. Did, did you sort of, how did you come up with that number? You know, saying, well, yeah. at least we need that. Cause I wanted it now one little paragraph too. We had a, uh, there's a group of us, we went through a group fast about a month ago and I had everybody keep a spreadsheet. And so we calculated that. And uh, for a number of us, you know, I was in the threes, but then on day three, it snapped to one. And then I did a seven day fast below that. I was, you know, after day three, I was under one and my lowest was 4.5 or something, 0.45. But yeah. it was interesting wow. that that was the pivot point. So in one way, how did you come up with that? And yeah, well, it came, we came up with it from a person that we work with, Trudy Dupont, who unfortunately passed away. Okay. She had a um, uh, diffuse infiltrating brainstem glioma. Uh, she lived seven years uh, with this. So we kept her, she, we think we kept her alive for a lo much longer period. She took no radiation or chemo. But when we were, t we, we initially said you should keep your blood sugar at 65 and your ketones at about three to five or three to four, somewhere in that area, millimolar, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, so she was religious in every day measuring independently her glucose and ketones and charting and plotting the num and giving us the numbers. And we plotted a plotted them out over a period of two years, if you can believe this. Wow. And w the variations were huge. Um, she got into a fight. She had a handicapped parking spot. Oh, she lived in Nice, uh, France. She was an American lawyer, graduated from the university of Wisconsin tremendous woman R run marathons and did all this very attractive mm -hmm. woman mm -hmm. um you know really really athletic and and then she she was diagnosed with this kind of tumor but she lived in nice france and um she had a handicapped parking spot she had a, a little bit of a cane she walked initially with a little bit of a limp but then a cane anyway she got into an argument with the neighbor who took her spot and I don't know she went upstairs and measured her blood sugar and it was like 150 milligrams per deciliter and she had been keeping it really low. And um, she emailed me and she said, you know, every time in the morning it gets really high. And then when I get into a fight with my neighbor and, and now I know my tumor is going to grow faster. And, and I said, what's your ketones? And she said, no, they're, st they're still pretty steady at about four and a half to five millimolar. Wow. So I said um, to my student, Josh Meidenbauer, because we were the ones who published the paper. That's right. You made the, the app in yeah. essence, right? Yeah. yeah. So I said to, I said to uh, um, Josh, I said, you know, this whole thing about the glucose is too capricious. Uh, it can vary from, from so many different kinds of things in the environment. You know, an argument to the morning, the morning effect, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But the ketones seem to be much more stable. So what if we divide the glucose by the ketones and see whether or not uh, we could uh, reduce some of the variation and some of the anxiety that these people would have. So we then replotted Trudy's two and a half year data with using a GKI because she, we had the data from that one individual and we replotted it and everything was so smooth. It was really beautiful. Hmm. It was just, oh, oh man. And then I told Trudy, I said, plot your GKI and, um, and you won't be so you don't get so um, about uh, anxiety attack is the result of your blood sugar elevating, and therefore when you do the ratio it doesn't look so bad. Yeah, and yep. she did that, and, and and we said, wow, this is so. Then we went back through all of our literature on the mouse uh, for all the keto calorie restriction and restricted diets and all these things that we did, and we recalculated the GKI and showed that it was linked to the size of the tumors. Wow. So you could that you could then you could then predict. Uh, that the level that the GKI, which now becomes a more meaningful physiological parameter, yes. is directly linked to how fast the tumors grow. That's amazing. So, so if for people um, to getting into therapeutic ketosis uh, using the GKI as a quantitative measure that allows people to know that if they're in this zone like you are in 1.0 or below, those tumors are going to be suffering. Great. So, so you have a biomarker a readily, easily measurable biomarker to tell a person whether or not they're in therapeutic ketosis. Right, right. And it's better to do it with blood than it was on urine strips. Now, we do urine strips because the ketone strips are a little bit more expensive. Yeah. 
but now they came out with the Keto Mojo, which is a um, yeah. uh, glucose ketone monitor like the Precision Extra, right. but the strips are much cheaper. They're about a dollar five rather than two sixty. Absolutely. So, you know, so people can use can use that as well. And we use you know chemical analysis and we do all these other things, but we did that for years. But we're we're using strips now too. Mm-hmm. But um, but the whole the whole process now is that you have you have a biomarker. The the problem with the cancer patients, and this is I get so many emails from all these cancer patients. Oh, I've done everything. I I can't get into into therapeutic ketosis. My my GKI is still around five to eight or whatever. And I said, what are you? Well, I'm on this kind of drug and that kind of drug and I said, well, you know, when we did all this stuff with, with Trudy and the mice, when the, these people, the mice or the, they were on any drugs. They were not having no drugs. I says, what are you doing? Well, we're taking dexamethasone for, you know, you got to get off all that right. stuff. Right. All right. You got to get, what are you taking poisonous chemicals that are going to give you anxiety uh, and, and incre- increase systemic inflammation? I mean, you're, you're actually interfering with, with, the, with the beauty of metabolic therapy. So, so um, I think that, you know, once, and people with cancer are, have anxiety just because they have a diagnosis of a disease that's potentially life-threatening. Right. And that itself ele- elevates glucocorticoids, which then elevate glucose. <laughs> so it's hard to get into a, G- into a, a therapeutic ketosis if you're, if, you're, if, if you're all stressed out all the time. Right, right. So that's why in the press pulse, we, 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 we put in um, uh, stress management as one of the key components in, in the press therapy. That's right. And, and that could be anything. I mean, it could be exercise. Uh, it could be yoga. It could be massage therapy. You know, I don't know. You know, inf- what are the e- needles that you put in your body? You know, those kinds of things. Acupuncture, right, for sure. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Right. You know, you, you can do whatever you think is going to do to, re- to reduce anxiety. And so, so really, so you're saying reducing anxiety, but what we're really talking about is reducing glucose as a yes, fuel because we're yes, taking down yes, whether yes, it's steroids or yes, stress or anxiety. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So by, by reducing anxiety, you reduce glucose. Right. So, so, so if you can get yourself into a, a into a, a, a new state, um, a, a new state of, of, of metabolic homeostasis, then these metabolic therapies will really be powerful right. uh, in, 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 re- in maintaining uh, the, the health of your body and also continuing to put metabolic uh, pressure on the tumor cells and also cleans up the micro environment. So the, so the inflammation in the micro environment goes way down, just like we showed. Right, right. And you can do all the molecular signaling cascades that you like, but the purpose is to reduce systemic and local inflammation. Right. This is going to, this is going to heal the micro environment. It's a healing kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. So the ketones are, are participatory in the healing process of the normal cells. So it, all together, you put it to, you put the whole process together, and it's a really nice, easy. I wouldn't say it's easy. I, I, I take that back. It, it requires a lot of participation on the part of the patient. Mm-hmm. If the patient doesn't buy onto this, it's going to be very, very hard. Right. If the family doesn't buy onto this, it's going to be hard because we've seen this happen. So it has to be a whole group participation in the healing process. And I think the other thing that you brought out in your former talks and so on is that it has to be a gradual process, not just about, you know, the <clears throat> eroding away the tumor, but gradual, I think, for patient understanding and implementation so they don't get overwhelmed yeah. with, oh, we got another variable here and here's what we'd like to do. Because in the end, it's actually really pretty simple. But to yeah. make the transition, uh, they feel like they're in free fall and this is a crazy guy. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and I thought I would take a moment to address a number of questions before the next podcast gets prepared. And that is people have asked a lot about a coaching program that we have started and are uh, building on. So this is a call for the next go round of the coaching program. And I thought I would go over some of the things that are gonna be included in this particular coaching intensive as some people have come to call it. What we'll be talking about are, are some of the basic things that everybody needs to know, calculating your macros, logging in your foods, you know, knowing what foods to use. Also, how to use your ketometer or how to measure ketones, whether it's uh, breath or urine, uh, your ketometer and your uh, glucometer, of course. And what's the difference and why would you use any of these? So those are basic things that need to go over. We'll go over labs, general recommended labs, so you can follow yourself and know, you know, what things will change when you're in ketosis, uh, what things will probably dramatically improve. We'll talk about insulin's role, insulin resistance, so you really have that understanding down diagrammatically and certainly in your own mind. 
it really applies to everybody. We'll talk about stress and its effect on uh, your own blood sugar and therefore what are some of the consequences. It's a actually big deal. Most people are unaware of that actually. We'll talk about various kinds of diet, keto versus zero carb or what has now come to be known as carnivore. We'll do a fasting trial collectively as a group uh, from one to seven days. I'll probably try a seven days. And most people, if they haven't fasted before, they'll probably do a day or two, maybe three. But to understand you know, how to do it, to be supported while you're doing it. We'll also talk about dairy. And speaking of fast, we'll do a dairy fast at a different portion, different part of the two-month program. So you get to be dairy-free for a couple of weeks. Not that you have to be, but to experience what it's like to be dairy-free. And then you know. Then you have the experience. It's not a with or without. It's knowing what the difference is. So in addition to this, or the way the group goes is we have a special Facebook group and there will be a maximum of 10 people in, so it's not a very large group. We have weekly meetings on Zoom, so it's like a Skype format where we check in with each other, primarily me to you all, and I cover one of the points in addition to um, everybody checking in. We will all log our foods into a thing called a chronometer, and we'll use that as a background of, of seeing how we're doing. And so in this Facebook group that will be combined with the previous group, Every so often we'll have special topics, maybe advanced labs to go over or advanced use of supplements and the biochemistry or uh, physiology of exercise relative to blood sugar in ketosis. And we can go on from there. I'd like to get into cancer a little bit so people have an understanding. We hear it's a cure-all. I think you need to know more about it before you can come up with a statement like that. And an in-depth look at fasting. And what changes. So these are some of the ideas that we're doing. Separate Facebook group, weekly meetings, accountability. Ideally, it'd be nice if we have a buddy system, but we'll see how that goes. That's pretty much a group determined uh, decision. So if you are interested, and a lot of people have sent me emails and uh, PMs if they're in the Facebook group, please send me your, your email saying, yes, I'm interested in the group. And what I will do is send you an application and also send you a list of what I consider are important requirements to participate. What I've learned from the first group was that I'm really just looking for people who are willing to take action and to get involved. It doesn't mean they have to be dedicated. This isn't, you know, superimposing some sort of right and wrong. This is basically going through this together, as opposed to somebody who just wants to listen to the information and never use it. I, I'm, I'm trying to not have those people uh, but to have the people that are willing to make a change because it is a transition. I certainly believe everybody needs some support to know what is expected and not expected of the transition into ketosis. And what are some of the long-term benefits that I've seen and uh, what you can expect? So if you're interested, feel free to email me at Dr. Goldcamp. So it's D-R-G-O-L-D-K-A-M-P at Keto Naturopath. Dot com. And if you're in the Facebook group, you certainly know how to PM me. Okay. Take care, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week.